Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. All right, well, that last Sunday we were talking about the um, substitutionary work of Christ. We are talking about His blood. And uh, so let's get into what did His blood purchase for us. In other words, His act of redemption, what did that bring to us? Amen? Uh, oh, yeah, Children's Church, you guys go ahead. Sorry, guys. Mr. James, they're waiting on you. All right, let's go to Romans chapter 5. Uh, of, of, there are several things that the blood of Jesus, his substitutionary work, made provision for for us. And it starts here with, uh, we are justified. The word justified is a legal word, and it has to do with our, our, our being um, declared righteous or our being um, um, conferred righteousness or decreed uh, of righteousness. And again, that meaning having a right standing or right relationship or brought into proper and right relationship with God. We've been justified. As one old preacher said one time, he said the word justified means just as if I'd never sinned. All right? So Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Thank God we've been saved from the wrath. Amen? Hallelujah. We're, we're not just, you know, we're, we are justified. We are saved from the wrath that is to come. A lot of people say, you know, there's, you know, God doesn't have any wrath. God's not going to do anything. God has wrath. And it is reserved. And it's going to come on people. Thank God that we got, when you get born again, you get what? Justified. And you're, you're now delivered from the wrath to come. Hallelujah. Let's go on over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse uh, 17 through 21. Again, we're talking about being justified, being talking about being declared righteous, that we've been brought into right relationship with God. Hallelujah. And so we'll read here from 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. <clears throat> Therefore, if any man be in Christ, well, thank God we can be in Christ. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. Let's back up one verse here. Verse 16 says, Wherefore, henceforth, no, no, we know man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Now, this is all a bunch of King Jimmy, uh, you know, double talk almost you know, because of the way the structure is. It says this, We don't know Jesus after the flesh. We know him after the Spirit. And see, here's the problem. A lot of people want to try to come up and know Jesus after the flesh when we are to know him after the Spirit. Hallelujah. Therefore, what? Because we know him no more after the flesh. We know him after the Spirit. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Let me, and all things are of God. Let me ask you all a question. When you got saved, did you forget who you were? Did you know where you lived? Did you know your mom and daddy? Did you know who, uh, your relatives? Did you forget anybody that you knew? No. So we know that the, everything passed away wasn't your mind. No, was it? Couldn't have been your mind. Why? Well, your mind still was intact. Your mind still knew. All right? Um, so oh, uh, if any man be in Christ, old things have passed away. Behold, all things. So all the old things have passed away wasn't your mind. Secondly, when you went to the mirror, did you recognize yourself? Everybody else, did you recognize yourself? Did you lose 60 pounds? Did you gain 45 pounds of muscle mass? No. So guess what it wasn't? It wasn't a physical, old things passed away, all things became new. Couldn't have been. You still had your mind intact. You still body, you still, when you looked in the mirror, the, the, I still recognized him. Amen. Okay. 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, gives us some insight into this. Paul prayed telling the church of Thessalonica, he said, I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. Your whole pneuma, spirit, suke, soul, and soma, body. Three different aspects of man. 
We've already covered two. The suke was still intact. You still knew who you were. You had all your cognitive skills. Your soma was still the same. You still looked the same. You still had the same body mass. You still, I mean, uh, whatever clothes you had on, you still had them on. But the third part that, that was different, the Bible said, so there's only one left that could be old things passed away and all things became new. And Paul gave us the secret in the previous verse, henceforth know we know man after the flesh. So the new birth is not a physical rebirth. It's a spiritual birth. You're born again. Now remember Jesus over in uh, John, the third chapter. You know, Nicodemus comes to him by, by night and says, uh, Master, we know that our teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles you do except God be with him. And J Jesus says, uh, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the man be born again or born anew, he shall not see the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus goes, uh, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born the second time? And all the women said, Dear God, I hope not. Amen. And Jesus said, are you a master or a teacher of all of Israel and you don't know these things? He said, that which is born of water. Well, let's look over there. Amen. Hallelujah. John 3, we're down to probably about verse 6 or so now. Except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 6. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. He clarifies what he meant in verse 5. If it may be born of water and of the Spirit, he not enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Being born natural birth gets you entered into this world, but Jesus said you must be born again. So what's the other birth? It's the spiritual birth. It's the new birth. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians refers to it as a, a, a man a being in Christ. Old things passed away, all things became new, and all things are of God. Hallelujah. And we go on, and, and we'll get further along here in just a minute. And, um, and marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. See, when you're born into the earth, your being exists, but, you know, you've got to be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. You've got to have the spiritual rebirth or the spiritual birth where your spirit's born again, made alive unto God, justified. See, we're talking about justification, okay? Made righteous. Back over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. All things are of God, and he... I mean, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, or to know, to wit, O King Jimmy, for know, uh, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. That's a good scripture to jump off and run off to a bunch of places we're not going to do today. But we're ambassadors. What's that? We got diplomatic immunity. We're not under the domain of the kingdom that we're actually walking in right now. Though you're of, in this world, you're not of this world. There's a lot of things there for us, praise God, that we can get around. Amen? Uh, somebody said amen. amen. Hallelujah. All right. And then he goes on here and says this. Um, As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For... He hath made him sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So here we have it. We have the Apostle Paul writing to the church and going, he who knew no sin. Now the King James Bible has the uh, words, he has, made him sin, he has made him to be sin. Now in the Greek, uh, the words to be are not there, or they're Greek equivalents. Okay, that's why the words are in italics here. Why? Because they're not there. Translators put them there thinking it would help in the ease or the, the clarity of reading it, but it's not there. So let's just take out what's not there anyway, added what they thought would help read it. I don't think it helps. I think it hurts. Okay, he has made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness or come into right relationship or have right standing with him in, of God in him. So what have we got here? Well, we've got what we talked about last week, substitution. See, his substitution at the cross, taking our place, taking our penalty, allows us to accept, become who he is. He became what we were so we could become what he is. What is that? Righteous before God. Right standing with the Father. In right relationship with the Father. <clears throat> Amen? He had to do that by being made sin for us. Okay? 
And now we are righteous. Now, I know you'll get people go all off the deep end. Oh, we're not righteous. I ain't nobody righteous. I'm I can tell you what. The Bible says in Romans 3, there's none righteous, no, not one. Glad you brought that up. Go over there. <laughs> Hallelujah. You see, the problem with only reading partial Scripture or pulling them out of context is you, you change or you um, manipulate the meaning of what that passage was. And when you do that, you do a disservice to everybody that you're talking to and everybody that's hearing you. You do it wrong when you don't give the context of what's going on. So here, Paul, um, let's look at the verse 1 of this chapter and we'll find out what's, what Paul's argument and what he's arguing and talking about. What advantage hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe, shall their unbelief make the faith of God out without effect? God forbid. Yea, that God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou might be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our righteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God, God unrighteous who takes vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? In other words, whatever you think is righteous and whatever you've come up with, folks, I want you to know something. God has a righteousness that we cannot achieve in our own abilities. You cannot come to the place where you earn and work out your righteousness. You want to come here? Come on in. Hallelujah. All right. Hallelujah. You can't earn your righteousness. You can't, get to, you can't get good enough to be righteous. You can't do it. And God's not unjust if he judges you according to his righteousness. Okay? Um, for if the truth of God had been more... Uh, I'm sorry. For how, for God forbid, how we should, shall we judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my life unto his glory, why am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we slain this report... And as some affirm, we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Now, see, what do you mean, let us do evil that good may come? People are, you know, come up with some of the dumbest stuff. God made me a prostitute so he could, he could make me, uh, you know, righteous or whatever, or work out something. That's just crazy stuff. What then? Are we better than they? Verse 9. No and no eyes, for we have proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Stop right there. This is the case Paul is arguing. He is not arguing that nobody's righteous. He is arguing in the without Christ state, nobody, nobody is better than, the Jew is not better than the Gentiles outside of Christ. Hello. And in Christ, there's no such, I am sorry. I know people use this term all the time, but it's not a biblical term. Messianic Jew. Jesus told the Jew, you must be born again. I've heard this for years. I've heard people, they, they get all whatever. I, listen, I know God's going to graft the, the, the natural olive branch back in. I know God has a promise to Abraham for the Jew. But he did not say become a Messianic Jew. He, Jesus said, you must be born again. And the bunch that at Antioch were called Christians were Jews. They were Jews who had gotten born again and became Christians. We come along and start doing separation, thinking we're being spiritual when we're not. We're doing disservice to the Word of God. Every man must be born again. Okay? Hallelujah. Um, I know, that's all, but that's, I, for years, that's kind of bothered me. I mean, I'm not talking about three or four. It's about decades, because I've heard this for years. And I thought, but the Bible said be born again. You know what? I believe that the church ought to stick with the Bible. Yeah. Instead of trying to be cute. We try to come up with cute stuff, and we get, you know, we got radical grace and radical faith. How about Bible faith and Bible grace? Yeah. How about just believing what the Bible says instead of trying to come up with some saying that makes everybody go, wow, when we can stay what the Bible says, let the, word, let the Holy Ghost take the Word of God, the anointed Word of God, and pierce the hearts of men and women and destroy the yoke, remove the burden because it's, the, because it's anointed, instead of trying to be cute with some kind of phraseology that we think is going make to it, make it better. Hello. We've got radical grace. We've got radical faith. I, I, I just thank God I got 
Bible faith and I got Bible grace. Amen? And born again Jews who become Christians at that point. All right, where was I? Verse what? 10. I, I lost, I turned the page. I went three books over, three chapters over. I was like, what, are we better than they know and know us? For we have proved, both Gentiles, that they are all under sin. But the Bible says they're all under sin. Now, we're not done because his, his, his argument does come to grace. But right now, his argument is that the Jew and the Gentile are all under sin. Verse 10. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. He's not talking about the New Testament believer. He's talking about the Jew or the Gentile outside of Christ. His proof, his point is that we're all under sin. We're all under the bondage of sin. We're all under the label of sin. That's why Jesus came. What? To get us out from under that label. To get us out from under that state. Okay? There's none righteous, no not one. There's none that understandeth. No. You know? None that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Their tongues have they dipped, uh, used um, deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of now, cursing. Now, if you're going to say there's none righteous, no, not one, you're going to say everybody, every Christian curses. He uses it in the same passage. He uses it as a, as, as a continuation of the same argument. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. How many killed somebody this week? Anybody here killed anybody? Well, according to the argument that nobody's righteous, you had to kill somebody. You had to, you had to shed some blood this week. Other people's blood. Well, there's one thing you poke your own finger. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace have they not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. I fear God. What am I trying to say? The argument where people come along and go, oh, the Bible says in Romans there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none righteous, there's no, no, not one. There's none righteous, no, not one. Bozo, read the whole thing. Get the context. Get what the meaning is. The meaning is this, that the Jew and the Gentile are both under sin when you're outside of Christ. Okay? Now, we know what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. What? that their mouth may be stopped. You have no one that can make a declaration outside of Christ that I'm righteous. That's what this whole passage is about. That the Jew and the Gentile are lost without God. They're under sin. They, they, don't, they, don't, they can't get there on their own. Um, and all the world may become guilty before God. Why must all the world become guilty before God? So all the world can accept the, the, the plan that God had to redeem them from being guilty. The Word of God is there. The Old Testament is there to, and, and bring us to Christ to determine and to declare that outside of Christ you're lost without hope, without God in this world, that you are full of Satan's in, a mindset. You walk in the realm of darkness but that, so that you can stand up and when the Word of God comes and you can recognize that you are guilty, not so you can feel bad, but that we can present Christ to you as the answer to your guilt. That you did not earn it. You did not achieve it on your own. But Jesus Christ came in the flesh, paid the price of the cross, became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Amen. And so these things were given, and these things are declared, that you can't get there in your ability, but when you come to Jesus Christ, the guilt that you have now come to understand you, you, that you have, and that you are, that you're sinful without, and, out, and sinful, and in rebellion against God, Jesus came. To overcome your guilt, to overcome your sin, to bring you out of a state of rebellion towards God, and to bring you into a place where you are now the righteousness or in right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Can't earn it. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. What, what, see, the law was given to tell you what sin was. And let me say this. I don't care what any bozo says today. Sin is still sin. And if the Old Testament said it was sin, it's still sin. Unless. 
And really, the Bible didn't call eating the, the different animals sin. It was told, if they were called unclean, you were told not to, and there were, there were dietary reasons. I saw some other, I, wanted, I mean, just, sometimes you want to go smack people. But you can't because, you know, God tells you not to lay hands on any man suddenly. And so there are days you want to do it hard, fast, and continuously. You just want to go smack, 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 smack. Somebody that wanted to be my friend on Facebook a couple, three years ago puts out there, um, um, if I hear one more person say that having a tattoo is a sin, I know, I know one more of these shrimp eaters say that tattoo is a sin, I'm going to do something. God did not say, rise, Peter, and get tattooed. Did he? Now, we've talked about this before. You know, if you've got tattoos, you know, you, if it's, if, I mean, you got them, you know. But you got, it's a new thing is for Christians to go out there and be like the world. Get gauges, get tatted up, put piercings all over the place. Act like the world. That's not what God wants for us. I said, that's not what God wants for us. Yeah, well, if I hear one of these shrimp eaters, hey, stupid. See, you just told me you haven't read your Bible. He's supposed to be really, he, he's always posting stuff. You know, you didn't read your Bible. What do you mean? Because Jesus showed them all manner of creatures. And told Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And he said, not so, Lord, for nothing unclean has ever crossed my lips. He said, what the Lord has cleansed, thou shalt not call unclean. Amen. Now, I know there's a double-fold meaning there, but here's the thing. You know, and, and if, if God did not, and my whole point was this, if God did not change something from the old covenant, then it's still sin or wrong. Does that make sense? You know, and you know, he said, and the Old Testament says this, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, do good to them despitefully use you. Amen? Love your neighbor. See, he changed it. It wasn't you get the eye for eye for tooth for tooth. As a believer, you're to do good for him. Amen. How about this one? The Old Testament, if you committed adultery, you're worthy of death. Under the New Testament, you look on a woman and think about it, you committed adultery. Jesus took it up another level. So, so in other words, sin is still sin. And I'm saying that because people run around with this, this new message out there, or that it's really not a new message, it's just an old heresy rewrapped under a new title. Do what? <laughs> heresy? Yeah. Well, there's heresy out there. Okay? And they rewrap it, and they say, you know, oh, you know, God, there's no sin, there's sin. no, it's all covered. Well, they even got people saying you're pre-forgiven. The new thing is you're pre-forgiven. Yep. Go ahead and do it because you're pre-forgiven. That's right, because you're pre-forgiven. Which is exactly what this is, that same spirit of universalism. It's the same spirit behind all this. You know, everybody's going to heaven no matter what they do. I'm sorry, Jesus said you must be born again. I don't care what, what PhD guy said. Y'all do know what PhD stands for, right? Post hole digger. Because a post hole digger got more sense than some of these guys went to theological seminary and came out with all these degrees who don't know their head from a hole in the ground. Thank you for your enthusiasm. All right. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now. Everybody say, but now. now. When? Now. When? Now. When did Paul say it was? Now. now. Or as we would like to say, at least I know down in eastern Carolina, we, uh, we say this uh, right now, or right now, right now, right now, all right? But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed, hallelujah, how, by who? The law and the prophets. The law and the prophets were witnesses to what was coming. A righteousness which was not of the law, a righteousness which was of the, of the Spirit, praise God, even... The righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, listen, unto all and upon all them that believe. Well, there's no difference. For all of sin, I'll, I'll say, listen, they'll, they'll read verse 10 and verse 3, 23. All of sin and comes short of the glory of God. Yeah. Next verse, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, here we have. A passage of Scripture that's so misused and so misinterpreted that people just, you ought to be ashamed of yourself for not being a better Bible, better, better, better Bible student. That sounded like I was babbling, didn't it? 
You ought to be ashamed of yourself for not being a better Bible student. When somebody says, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, I've got scriptures to substantiate that. As a matter of fact, in the very chapter where you want to quote, there's none righteous, no, not one, he goes on and says, but now, but now, the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus, is unto all and upon all them that believe. When? Now. When's now? Right now. It's right now. It's now. So those who say there's none righteous, no, not one, have misconstrued and misinterpreted the Scripture. And as, as Peter said, you know, many people who read Paul's writings, they do, uh, who are unlearned, unlearned. He says, just flat out says it. He says they're unlearned. They do rest the Scriptures. And that word rest, only used one time in the King James New Testament, and it means to twist. Okay? So Peter says the unlearned rest the Scriptures. Okay? And so, you know, well, those people go around saying they're righteous. No, I'm not saying I'm righteous. God declared me righteous, what? By faith in Christ Jesus. Why? Because I don't know anymore after the flesh. His substitutionary work and taking my sin and taking my place now me, allows me, what? To be made like him. Oh, oh, oh. And I said, wait a second. What did Ephesians say? He raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where's Jesus seated? At the right hand of the Father. Guess where you are? You're not there as Ellie. You're not there as Melanie. You're there as part of the body of Christ. You're in the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. Not your own. Your righteous. Oh, yeah, our righteousness is as filthy rags. You got that right, buddy. See, they want to quote that and think we're still in them. I, I turned those in. When I about got born again, I turned in my old suits and got a new suit. Amen. Hallelujah. See, it's like a prisoner. What, what do they do for prisoners when they come out of prison? The, one, the last thing they do when they come out of prison is they turn in those old prison garb and they get a new suit and walk out the door. And you see, the last thing we did when we came to Jesus, when we came to him, the last act of being in the kingdom of Satan was we turned in our garments of righteousness and put his own glory to God and walked out the gate a new man. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There's nothing on my clothing that indicates that I was in that prison. Now, if they send me out in that prison garb, everybody know I was an old prisoner. Look at, look at uh, Gwen over here this morning, her bright orange. Is there a P on the back of her shirt? Okay. You know, uh, G, C, J, Guilford County Jail. Anything like that on the back of her shirt? No. no. All right. But if you took every prisoner who was released and sent them out the door in their prison clothes, everybody in the community would go, oh, they're a prisoner. They would identify them, what, as a prisoner, as a convict, as a criminal. They take, but see, they don't do that. They take that last thing that identifies them as a prisoner. Put them in a new suit and send them out the door. And if, you, if you're out there in public and you see them walking, you have no idea that they were a prisoner. Amen. Go there and sit between them. Just sit right in between them. We'll put Melanie on it. See, when you, were, when, you were, when you were a sinner, when you were lost without God, your garb, your garb was the righteous, your righteousness. And it was filthy rags. And it didn't stand before God that pleased God, and God would not accept it. And you couldn't, get, you couldn't get out of that place because of the clothing you wore. But when you came to Jesus, and he exonerated you, and he expunged your record, he declared you righteous, glory to God. He called you a new man, hallelujah. He made you righteous before God, glory to God. He set the record straight and set you right with, with heaven and all the things of the world, glory to God. And you walked out the door. You didn't walk out in your righteousness, praise God. Because when you went by him, he took the cloak of righteousness that was on him and put it on your back, glory to God, and said, you are now a child of God. You are a part of the body of Christ. You're a glory to God. You're a heir of God and a joint heir with me, glory to God. You've been raised up and made to sit with me in heavenly places. And when you stand there, at the, right there with Jesus, and the father looks over. He does not see the old rags. He sees a new man. 
Can you imagine what Satan went through on the day of Pentecost? Or when the, you know, the, the whole bunch got, got set straight up there. But can you imagine, you know, Jesus breathing and said, receive you the Holy Ghost, they got born again. But that wasn't, that wasn't everybody. And then you got there the day of Pentecost, everybody got born again and filled with the Holy Ghost that was left. Hallelujah. Can you imagine Satan looking up there? Let's, let's say, we got 120 who were already born again when Jesus breathed on them. But then they, Peter stumbles out of there, drunk on the Holy Ghost. Says these men are not drunk as ye suppose, seeing us, but the third hour of the day, it's about nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that which spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Thank God I get to still see visions. Now, Brother Bill, I think he I heard him last week saying he had a couple of dreams. Hallelujah. <laughs> Just pick it on your brother Bill. Hallelujah. Brother Larry been dreaming dreams for years. Hallelujah. <laughs> I see pulling for Duke will age you quicker than normal. <laughs> Hallelujah. But, you know, and so they preach us. Peter gets up and says, preach that 10-minute sermon, maybe. And 3,000 people get saved. Can you imagine the hissy fit that hell was having? Because, see, they just got Jesus, and he, he went back to heaven. He left a few down here that were walking around looking like him. And then one guy goes out and preaches one sermon, and 3,000 more look just like him. And by the end of that week, another 5,000 was added to the church. At the end of the first week, there was 8,120 believers. I mean, Satan had just been dealing with one. He couldn't deal with one. And now God turned loose on the earth, 8,120, glory to God. Every time somebody gets born again, they, look, they, they put on the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. They are cloaked in the garments that Jesus wears. Satan don't know the difference until you let him know, let him in on it. He comes prodding you with all kinds of things, and you, you respond outside of faith. He, oh, I know what they are. They're one of them unbelieving believers. You need to get back to being a believing believer. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. We're not going to finish. I, I've got all this done in Winston this morning. What have gotten so far? One point out of five. Let's see what we got here. Hallelujah. Well, Garrett said we could have some extra time this morning, so um, anybody want to sit in the window so you can fall out so we can go raise you from the dead? Remember, Paul was long and preaching. The guy fell out. He had to go... <coughs> 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 had to go raise it from the dead. <coughs> <coughs> and then he went the rest of the night. <laughs> no, you ain't. <laughs> I'm just going to live and not die. <coughs> <coughs> praise God. So, we have, we've been justified. Isaiah 118, Isaiah 118. It says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I think the next verse says, if you're willing and obedient, you eat the good of the land. God said, come now, let us reason together. What's the reason? Here, here we go. Uh, you're messed up, I got the fix. The reason is, you figured out you're in trouble. He's got the answer. God has the answer for where you are, what you're dealing with, what you're going through. Amen? And so, we know him no more after the flesh. So the first thing that the substitutionary work of Jesus brings to us is justification. Being brought into proper and right relationship with God. What does that mean? Now see, people take that, they go off the deep end with it. Because you've been brought into the right relationship with God and you couldn't earn it, that just, it just, just, just doesn't matter what you do. And we'll get to some more of this later. 
when we get into uh, him purging your conscience, we, don't have to, we, we cannot even attempt to go there this morning. All right? We're, we're just way down the road from being able to do that this morning. Hallelujah. Look, if you will, uh, Ephesians 1.7. We're going to cover one, one more short one before we move, and then we'll pick back up next Sunday. All right? And then the following Sunday, Dean Tad will be with us. Ephesians 1, 7, what, 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 after we've been justified, what do we get? We get redemption. We will re now, redemption, how many remember SNH green stamps? Yeah, go to the grocery store, you know, buy a certain amount, and they crank, those, they crank that little thing out, and you went home, got your little coupon book out, and stuck them all in there, and you count them. And then you go to the book, redemption book, and see what you could buy with them. Don't remember that, huh? SNH green stamps. It's like... Mm -mm, mm -mm. When you went to the grocery store, they gave you so many stamps for your, that, that matched the purchase do amount in dollars. And after you accumulated a certain amount, you could buy stuff. Now, if you wanted something like a radio, you had to buy like 2500 You had to get like 2500 or whatever, some crazy amount. If you wanted a lollipop, you know, I mean 50 or something, I forgot. You know, but whatever. You know, you, and you had a book, and when you, you, got, you took all your, your stamps, and when you bought it, you licked them and stuck them in the book. And then when you got to the certain amount that you wanted to buy, whatever they had in the redemption catalog, you took your SNH green stamps down there and redeemed them for that thing. The, you bought it. So that's what that word means. It means to buy. Now, it, it's kind of like, how many remember the, um, most of y'all probably watch Wheel of Fortune now, and they all win money and stuff like that. But back in the day, when it was a daytime game show, They'd have all these sponsors put Broy Hill furniture over here or this over there, some kind of something like that. And when you won, you had to spend what you won on the items in there. And they were overpriced like crazy. You know, a, a chair was for $600. You've got from Broy Hill. It's recliner. You know, let me just, you know, in the 70s, that was a very, 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 very expensive recliner. You know, you get a color TV. It was four times what you buy it for in the store. You know, you, walk, you didn't walk out with money. You walked out with the products that the sponsors had put on the show. Okay? That's what, but you, you, you redeemed that. Now, we've been redeemed. We've been purchased, with, not with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Amen? Yeah. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Colossians 1, 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. That's the same verse. It's the same writer. Same guy wrote it. Can y'all say amen? Well, if the same guy wrote it, he's going to write stuff similar. All right. The next verse, Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. That's talking about Christians. Um, Pastors, talking about pastors, you know, to what? To feed the church of God. Why? Which he purchased with his own blood. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus takes it personal. You ministers start giving garbage to his people that he paid the, paid the price to purchase them instead of feeding them the word of God. He, don't, he does not appreciate it. Well, I got lots of money. la di da Everybody you know, applauds and applauds and talks about how great I am. Yeah, remember Eli's sons? They were down at the temple. Now, I don't, I don't know how to say this real nice, but they were, they, were, they, were, they were getting in some extra activity time with the women because of their position. And their father wasn't doing anything about it. And the Lord warned them. He didn't do anything about it. And so he took them out. And then they came and told Eli, and he was excessively overweight and fell over backwards and broke his neck. Talk about cleaning house in one day. Women could go to the temple and not be assaulted. God, God does not appreciate that. And when ministers milk people under the guise or, uh, of whatever, of some new heavy revy, he doesn't appreciate it. He wants us to feed the church of God. He bought that church with his blood. He paid the price with his own blood to get him into the kingdom. Amen? And so Jesus' act of substitution um, justifies and redeems us, purchases us. His blood was the, was, the, was the bartering system to buy us out of our, our, our captivity 
in Satan's kingdom. Amen? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.